Hello, this is Jonathan Busco. Welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss infectious diseases. By the end of this session, you'll be able to define communicable and infectious diseases as well as infection. List five red flag signs of severe illness in a patient with an infectious disease. List four general treatment principles of patients with infectious diseases. And list five common shipboard infectious diseases and know where to get more information on how to treat them. So a communicable or an infectious disease is a disease caused by an infectious agent. And generally we think of infectious agents as bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. There are other odd ones, but these cover the majority of the cases of infectious diseases that you'll see. An infection is invasion by the host, uh, of the host by an infectious agent, and there's an illness that results, usually. Not always. There are some people who are infected who aren't ill, but for the most part, you become ill because the infectious agent is releasing toxins and damaging your body, and your immune system responds to the invasion, and actually, a lot of the symptoms that you get come from that immune response. Endemic diseases are diseases that are always present, so in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, Malaria is endemic. It's always there. An epidemic disease is a disease that spreads and affects many people simultaneously or near simultaneously in a given area, and that could include a ship, so an outbreak of lice could become epidemic. In a pandemic, the disease spreads everywhere. That's globally, and when we talk about some of the flus, uh, we worry about them being pandemic. A carrier is a host who has the infectious agent, so in a sense they're infected and they can spread it, but they're not ill. And a contact is someone who's come into contact with that person or any infected person, and they may or may not have gotten the infection. So they might not be, have an infection, but they've at least been exposed to the infectious agent. And an incubation period is the time it takes from your exposure when you first get the infection until you show symptoms. An isolation period is a time in which a patient would be contagious and needs to be isolated from others to prevent disease spread. And a quarantine period is when you've got an exposed person who doesn't have symptoms, but it's in the incubation period, so they could in fact have an infection and might become communicable. And so they need to be quarantined from others. Ships can also be put into quarantine for the incubation period of a, a disease if uh, port authorities have any concern that there may be people on board exposed to a disease who haven't yet developed symptoms. And this can also be called a segregation period. So what are these infectious agents? Well, bacteria are very common. These are unicellular organisms, so single cell, they're considered to be alive. They've got a nucleus, they've got DNA, they've got all the things that we consider to be part of a living cell. They reproduce by splitting. So they divide into two, and that's how they make new bacteria. And so their DNA can be modified and evolve on its own, but bacteria, sometimes not even of the same species, can come together and share genetic material. And this can accelerate evolution and it becomes a real problem for the issue of drug resistance, antibiotic resistance, where one species that is commonly resistant shares those genes for resistant with another species that isn't resistant to the antibiotic, and now that other species becomes resistant to the new antibiotic. Bacteria live everywhere. The world is covered with a thin film of feces, and most of that is bacteria, and most of them are non-pathologic. They won't hurt you at all, and there's many that are very beneficial to humans. So we have bacteria in our gut that aid in digestion, and without them, we wouldn't be able to digest a lot of the things that we can't. It's really the location of the bacteria that matters. So the, the bacteria that live in your mouth if they migrate into your gums, they become a dental infection. If they get into your lung, they become a pneumonia. And the 
bowel flora, the bacteria in your gut that are so helpful in digestion, if they get into your bladder, you get a urinary tract infection. Typically with bacteria, your infection starts as local symptoms because they come to one part of the body and they invade that part of the body. And then they can spread through the bloodstream and cause disseminated symptoms either from the damage that the toxins do to those target organisms or because of your body's immune response, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So your body responds to the invasion and this becomes problematic. And they're treated with an antibacterial, but in medicine, the word antibiotic, anti-life, is equivalent to antibacterial. So when somebody talks about an antibiotic, they're talking about a drug specifically for treating bacterial infections. And this is important because if someone has a viral infection, giving them an antibiotic won't treat the infection and in fact just promotes antibiotic resistance, something beyond the scope of what we're discussing here, but very important for all of us. So viruses are maybe alive, maybe not. There's some debate about that. They're, if they are, they're a single-celled organism. They don't really have all the pieces of a cell. They can't make their own energy. They don't have a real cell wall, just sort of a capsule around them. And they do have genetic material, either DNA or RNA, but they can't reproduce on their own. So they just sort of float around and they bump into stuff and cause disease. So when they bump into a host cell, they basically have a spring-loaded mechanism for firing their genetic mechanism, their genetic material, into that host cell. And they hijack the cell. And there's four outcomes from that. There's the immediate infection, which results in cell death. So the cell is taken over. It makes lots of new viruses. It then ruptures and releases all these new viruses. And so when you have a cold, that's what's going on in your nose. The genetic material can do something called transformation, which is the that viral genetic material happens to get into the wrong place in the host cell's DNA and it turns the cell into a cancer cell. And that's really problematic. You can get what are called latent infections where the genetic material just hangs out sometimes for years and then becomes reactivated and then you kind of go back to the first type of infection. You get cell death and lots of new viruses. And then you can get chronic infection where you have low-grade infection over many years but never overwhelming infection and, on the other hand, never a cure. When you have a cold, your body eventually kills off all the cold viruses and you go back to normal. But there are people who have low-grade viral infections for years. They live everywhere. Children are petri dishes for this. Uh, you look at any daycare or any elementary, middle, or even high school, and you'll see that when a cold comes in with one kid, it spreads everywhere. They typically enter through the mucous membranes, and they can cause local symptoms like a cold or a viral sore throat, or acute sinusitis is almost always from viral infection, gastroenteritis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, that's viral, and it's causing local symptoms. But you can also get systemic symptoms in part from the effects of the local infection. So if you're, you've got a cold and you're not sleeping well, then you'll feel fatigued and, and lousy. If you have gastroenteritis and have bad diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, you're going to get dehydrated. But you can also get systemic symptoms from some of these uh, as well. So influenza is primary pulmonary, but you get systemic symptoms, or HIV, which is actually attacking your own immune system. Viruses are really, really simple. And the problem is, is they use all the same building blocks that we do. Um, our own bodies are essentially using the same materials to function. And so a, an antiviral, while it will target viruses, will also, because of the fact that they're so similar to their host cells, cause a lot of side effects. They target human cells as well. So it's not a very specific treatment. And usually we provide symptomatic care, specific viruses. We have antivirals for them with a lot of side effects. And fortunately, our immune system is able to handle most of these viruses without a problem. 
Fungi can be single or multicellular organisms. They have cell membranes and then they're sugar coated, uh, what's called a polysaccharide coating. They need oxygen to live and they, they typically like warm, moist places, but that's not universally true. And they're treated with antifungal medications. And they can cause lots of different types of infections. You can get skin infections like uh, the tinnias, athlete's foot, for example. Um, they can infect the hair and the nails. They can go under the skin and cause subcutaneous infections. And they can cause systemic disseminated infections, which is really bad. Some of them are host dependent. Uh, Candida albicans in a, your normal host will cause a vaginitis in a, a female or it can cause thrush, an infection in the mouth where you've got this fungus living there. But in an immunocompromised patient like an HIV patient or a post organ transplant patient on immunosuppressants, this, this thrush in the mouth can go down into the esophagus and cause an esophagitis, or it can disseminate through the whole body and you can have candida in your blood, and that would never happen in a normal host. <clears throat> There's also some weird fungal infections like cryptococcus which you inhale in through your lungs, but it doesn't give you a pneumonia. Instead, it gives you what's called a meningoencephalitis, so it's an infection of the brain. And aspergillus, which is really weird, actually can cause an allergic reaction type response. So not really an infection type response specifically, but more of acute anaphylaxis. And there's a, a theory that because the U.S. peanut supply is so contaminated with aspergillus that that may be a big part of what peanut allergy actually is, is this aspergillus response. But aspergillus can also release these toxins, mycotoxins or fungal toxins, which cause liver damage and cancer. So that's problematic too. Now, we are surrounded by a world of things that are trying to kill us. And your immune system is absolutely astounding in being able to keep you alive. And it's escalating warfare. So every time we get a better immune response, the enemy, the infectious agents, get better at attacking us. So these are some important terms. An antigen is any substance that causes your immune system to respond. And typically it's proteins uh, on a, the cell wall of a, of a bacteria or a protein that's part of a virus. And your body sees it and says, OK, boom, let's fire off an immune response. An allergen is something that shouldn't cause an immune response, but does. And so you get allergic symptoms. So for example, if you have hay fever, um, you inhale this allergen and you get a runny nose, which is a defense mechanism for washing stuff out of your nose. And you're, you start making tears, and we'll talk about why tears are important. And you sneeze, which blows the allergen out of your body. Well, this allergen isn't going to hurt you, so you shouldn't respond that much. An antibody is a protein that your body makes that recognizes a specific antigen. And we'll talk more about this because they're very cool. And then you've got these things called white blood cells. They're your immune cells in your bloodstream. And they're what does a lot of the work, although not all the work, of your immune system. So you've got this stuff called innate immunity, and it's, it's what you're born with. It's not specific for any particular invader, and you get it from your parents. It's passed on genetically. So you've got these surface barriers. So your skin is an incredible barrier to an invader. It really can't be penetrated unless it's broken, with very few exceptions, and protects you in ways we could never imagine. It's just such an important part of our immune system. You've got pulmonary cilia, which are these little cells with tails sticking out. The tails wag to push upwards. And so you're producing this st sticky mucus in your pulmonary tract. You also make it in your gut. Um, and the sticky mucus catches these invaders. And then these cilia basically wave. And they wave upwards and push these mucus balls of invaders up your trachea, out of your lungs, and it falls back through your larynx, larynx into your esophagus and down into your stomach. And you never even realize this. Your stomach is a seething cauldron of death for foreign invaders. You've got acid and enzymes, and they just kill stuff. You've got these cool things called lysozymes, which are enzymes, proteins that destroy 
gram positive bacteria, which are the, a lot of the ones that live on your skin, and you, your saliva and your tears and your snot and your sweat's full of lysozymes. So those are constantly killing bacteria on your body. And then you've got these nonspecific effector cells that help the body kill and dispose of all these foreign invaders, and they're recruited by other cells in your body. So you've got these things called T lymphocytes, and this is what's called your cell-based immunity. You've got a type called inflammatory T cells. They respond to inflammation, and they recruit these other types of cells called macrophages, which are big eaters, macrophage, and those eat all the your foreign invaders. You've got these cytotoxic T cells, which make chemical weapons. These little toxic granules are basically toxic bombs that kill virus-infected cells and cancer cells, just wipe them right out. And then helper T cells, which help your B cells, which we'll talk about next, make antibodies, which are the sort of a huge part of your immune response. Your B cells are amazing. You develop millions of them. They're everywhere, and they're designed to recognize specific antigens, specific antigens you've never seen before. So they're just floating around looking for invaders that y your body's never seen. And when they see it, they become activated. And one of two things happen. They become memory cells, and those don't react now. But they're able, if they see the same invader again, to react quickly. So they're basically primed. They're put on a hair trigger. And most of those go and live in your lymph nodes. They're very long-lived. Others become plasma cells, and so they produce antibodies, these proteins that look specifically for that antigen. They're very short-lived. They die when all the antigen is gone, but they just start dumping out antibodies. So these B cells are not only fighting infection now, but they're preparing your body for repeat infection in the future, which is really, really smart. Your body waits until it knows that this antigen is something that can that has attacked you once and could attack you again before it puts all the energy into making a system for responding quickly to it. These antibodies, they're protein chains, they bind to antigen and they help in three ways. Um, if you've got all these giant tinker toys hanging off your body and you're a bacteria, you're, you're no longer efficient in evading, invading other cells. Mechanically, you've got anchors dragging off of you, so you can't physically invade anymore. So that's very helpful. They activate something called complement, uh, which is some chemicals floating around in your bloodstream. And when complement gets activated, it also brings in the big eaters, the macrophage. Phage means to eat. Uh, but also makes something called a membrane attack complex that we'll talk about. And they activate all those effector cells. So you've got phagocytes, eaters, so they eat. You've got mast cells and cells called neutrophils, which release granules of materials that help with the immune response. And these cool cells called natural killers, which release cytokines, enzyme, enzymes that help to kill these invading cells as well. So... The complement is a bunch of circulating protein that attaches to the walls of invaders and makes something called a membrane attack complex. And that's what you're seeing in that picture. The membrane attack complex punches a hole through the cell wall and fluids just pour in and kills the cell. It's crazy efficient, just mechanical, a mechanical destruction, um, holing of the hull of these bacteria or other other uh, invaders, and they attract the phagocytes, the cells that eat other cells. Now, your body also has this interesting system of lymph nodes, and lymph nodes are basically vessels that run parallel to the veins that flow through things called lymph nodes. And when your blood flows through your arteries and gets down to the arterioles and then to the level of the capillaries, the plasma actually leaks out of the arterioles at that point. And it's the formed elements, the cells that go through the capillary vessels themselves. And it's the plasma that kind of 
flows alongside outside of those vessels through the soft tissue through all the cells there and is exposed to everything that's there and picks up debris and all sorts of other stuff and then at the far end of your capillaries hydrostatic pressure pushes a lot of that fluid back in but there's a good amount that doesn't go back in and that gets collected by your lymph system and so that fluid now full of all the debris and bits and pieces of foreign invaders and bacteria and viruses etc gets carried back through these lymph vessels to lymph nodes and the lymph nodes are full of those memory cells the ones that have previously seen antigen and so those now look for antigen they've seen before and if they see it they have this rapid huge immune response and so the white blood cells become activated and they release antibodies and they become inflamed and the whole system takes off and you get an immune response so it's a it's sort of like water flowing down a city street pouring into a sewer and in your sewer system you have sensors to detect weapons of mass destruction and if you trigger one then you respond to it immediately so what's an infection your infectious agent invades your host and you may or may not have local symptoms and you may or may not ever develop symptoms from this you may simply become a carrier but if you do the infection spreads and you get symptoms from the agent and from the toxins it's releasing and you get symptoms from your immune response so think about the last time you had a flu shot you didn't get the flu but you may have gotten muscle aches and pains and some of the symptoms that you get when you get the flu and that's because your immune system is responding to the immunization it's seeing what looks to be a new invader your your B cells are reacting and they're producing some antibody and you're you're getting an inflammatory response so you get some of the symptoms you would get because your body's doing what it's supposed to be doing it's responding to this foreign invader now the outcome of this is that your immune system hopefully will kill the agent but the agent could kill you if it's too toxic and unfortunately we can get an excessive immune response with a systemic inflammatory response syndrome where we respond too much and that over response kills us and that's what happens to a patient who's septic they get an overwhelming infection and then the body's response on top of that is too much and the patient ends up dying how do infections spread well they can they can spread through direct contact so touching people hosts carriers a carrier touches somebody else and spreads the bacteria that way they can spread through sex they can spread through contaminated surfaces they can spread in droplets in the air through coughing they can spread from feces to mouth typically by hand have you ever had a viral gastroenteritis what happened was someone else had it and they didn't wash their hands and they touched a doorknob and then you touched the doorknob and got their stool and viruses on your hands and then you ate something or touched your mouth and you ended up with a gastroenteritis and then you can have live vectors like insect bites or animal bites that spread infectious agents you can also have inanimate vectors and these are pretty common so food and water are very common vectors for infectious agents soil is full of all sorts of infectious agents and you that's where they live and then you get contaminated soil into a wound and you can get infected and then things called fomites which are inanimate objects that are transferring these infectious agents so bedding or clothing or books or stethoscopes so if you've ever wondered whether or not your doctor cleans a stethoscope between each time he sees you maybe you should ask because he could be carrying whatever was on the last patient to you with a stethoscope infections can present lots of different ways you can have a local infection like an abscess or cellulitis a skin infection urinary tract infection or an upper respiratory tract infection and pneumonia you get local symptoms depending on where that infection is so in, with an abscess you might have pain cellulitis you get the red rash the large patch of of redness um, with a pneumonia you get a cough with a urinary tract infection burning and discomfort when you pee 
and you may have systemic symptoms with this because you get an immune response. So you may feel lousy. You may get some fevers as part of that immune response. You may get myalgias, muscle aches, or arthralgias, joint aches, or both. You may get headaches. Those are all typical, pretty nonspecific responses to infection. In a disseminated infection, so spread through the bloodstream, if you've got bacteria or other viral invaders through the bloodstream, influenza, for example, you've got a fungal infection, you've got pyelonephritis, an upper urinary tract infection, you'll get local symptoms from whatever the initial infection and source of invasion was, but then you'll get systemic symptoms as well. And those are all the things that you can see with a local infection, but they're much more pronounced. So if you've got a patient who's got an infection, and you think they've got some infectious disease, you need to figure out, is this bad? Is this something that's going to cause them to die or rapidly spread through the crew and kill lots of people? What do I need to do? So if you have a fever, your heart rate goes up. But if you are treating the fever and the fever goes down and they still have a high heart rate, that's a bad sign. Low blood pressure and in infection, that's a bad sign. Altered mental status is very concerning because it's either not enough blood flow to the brain, so they're in septic shock, or they have infection of the brain. Either is bad. Moderate to severe headache makes you think about infection of the brain, uh, meningitis, encephalitis, or meningoencephalitis. Petechiae or purpura, and you remember those are the collections of blood right under the skin with breakage or leakage of the capillaries, and those are very bad signs, particularly in someone with a headache and fever. That can be a sign of meningococcal meningitis, but regardless, it's a sign that your body's clotting system isn't working right, and that's a pretty significant infection. Severe abdominal pain with signs of infection, there's so many catastrophic things that can happen in the cavity of mystery related to infections. So that's always bad. And respiratory distress is always bad. So if you see any of these, your first thought needs to be, I've got to get this patient off the ship because something really bad is going on with this infectious disease. Talk to medical control. Arrange your evacuation. Now we'll talk about some common or potentially common infections you can see. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. Use your textbook for more information. Use other textbooks. Some of the wilderness medicine textbooks are excellent resources. You can get a internal medicine or family medicine textbook and look at the infectious disease section, any of a number of online resources, and of course talk to medical control. But Vibrio cholera, it's spread by fecal oral spread, typically contaminated water, and it can very quickly become epidemic, and typically what would happen is it would be in a city that you arrived at and in the water system. The presentation is typically severe non-bloody diarrhea with symptoms of dehydration and no fever. And it's going to be very hard to distinguish this from other diarrheal illnesses, but there's just a lot of diarrhea. There's typically no fever. And while this can be fatal because of the dehydration, as long as you hydrate the patient uh, with quite a bit of fluid, they'll typically do fine. Dengue fever is a virus. It's transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito and very, very common for travelers to tropical and subtropical regions. It's not person-to-person -person contagious. You have to be bitten by the mosquito. Uh, the presentation is going to typically be fever and headache, severe muscle aches and pains, very severe, very fatigue. About half of them will have rash or nausea and vomiting. About a third will have diarrhea. And it's in its severe form, it's hemorrhagic, so petechiae and purpura, and that's really, really bad. So if they're really sick, evacuate them. You're going to have a hard time distinguishing this from meningitis or other diseases, so you're probably going to be thinking about evacuation. Otherwise, symptomatic treatment for a very mild case um, if you and medical control are convinced that this is what's going on. Diphtheria is a uh, bacterial infection. The occurrence of bacterium, diphtheria causes it. We all got immunized for this, and when you get your tetanus updates, you're re-immunized for this. But it's a waning immunization. And some people have never been immunized, uh, particularly in some of the ports that you're calling on. So 
we think of it uh, typically as a respiratory tract infection. It can also be a skin infection, and it is person-to-person -person contagious. So you've got a person with this gradual onset of feeling lousy, low fevers. If they have the skin version, they have skin ulcers with gray membranes over them. If they have the respiratory version, the posterior oropharynx has this gray membrane that's stuck to the back. It's hard to scrape off. You try to, it causes some bleeding. Uh, to treat it, it's antibiotics. Talk to medical control. They'll advise you on the best choice. Now this is one you'll see a lot of. Otitis externa, often called swimmer's ear. Uh, the ear outside of the tympanic membrane. So the external ear, the canal, the ear itself, the surrounding skin gets infected and it can either be caused by excessive dryness and I, I saw this quite a bit in Alaska when I was there because of the very cold dry air the skin would crack and there was a lot of otitis externa or excessive moisture so people who swim who have a lot of moisture in the ear causes irritation maceration or breakdown of the skin of the ear and they end up with infection so the presentation is an itchy painful ear there may or may not be drainage um, you look in the canal the canal is swollen it's full of debris there may be some swelling of the ear the external ear that you can see um, that gets swollen red sometimes, and it may hurt when you pull on the ear. The treatment is 2% acetic acid, so that's one part wine vinegar to three parts of potable water. You put four to six drops in, in the affected ear three times a day for seven to ten days. If it's a really severe case, there's a lot of swelling, you take 1% tetracycline ointment, you drop 5 mLs of that, and you very gently inject that into the canal and leave it in for a week. And you don't want to swim or soak the ear until you're better for at least two weeks. In otitis media, it's an infection of the middle ear. So there's a space between the tympanic membrane and the inner ear. It's an air space. It's connected by the eustachian tube to the back of the throat. So it's an open space. And a lot of times, people who think they have ear infections just have overpressurization, not infection there. So you get a viral upper respiratory tract infection. You've got a cold, runny nose, sneezing cough, all the typical symptoms. The eustachian tube it gets inflamed, and now you get overpressurization, and so an ear starts to hurt. But if you look at it, look at the ear itself, the tympanic membrane is normal looks the same as the other side which has no symptoms or the patient has cold symptoms and both ears hurt well true bilateral otitis media is incredibly rare incredibly rare and so more often than not it's simply that both eustachian tubes are inflamed and the person basically has barotitis media or pressure inflammation of the middle ear so the presentation is ear pain possibly hearing loss if there's a lot of pus in that space they may have a loss of balance because the inner ear helps to contribute to knowing where we are in space and to maintain our balance. So if you have infection right next to it, that can affect your balance. You look in the ear, you see a red bulging eardrum, and if the tympanic membrane perforates, then you may actually have pus draining out from the ear. Uh, the treatment for an otitis media is to talk to medical control about what oral antibiotics to use, and then you're going to have some kind of an ophthalmic anesthetic, uh, tetracaine, preparacaine, something to numb the eyes. If you put a couple of drops of that in the ear every four to six hours, it numbs up the ear, and that alone takes care of most of the symptoms. And we've found through research that, in fact, even if someone has a bacterial otitis media, the body typically takes care of it without any help from antibiotics. You can give the antibiotics, but it, the body would normally take care of it on its own. And if you can control the symptoms, most people are fine. However, if you truly see one and you look and the tympanic membrane is red and bulging, the, the treatment would include oral antibiotics. So discuss that with medical control. Mononucleosis, or mono, is an Epstein-Barr virus infection, and in... Africa, um, this is actually a very common cause of a type of cancer, a type of lymphoma, but this is not the way it presents in the rest of the world, typically. It's highly contagious with close contact. It's considered the kissing disease. So one teenager gets it, um, his girlfriend gets it, and then some other people get it, 
and some other guys get it and some other girls get it and soon everybody has it. Um, it can also be transmitted by coughing in people's face up close. Up close. It's a childhood disease in poor countries where there's overcrowding. It's an adolescent disease in wealthy countries, but typically everybody uh, has had this and is immune by age 40. It can infect the liver and you can get an enlarged spleen from it as well and that becomes problematic because the spleen can actually spontaneously rupture it becomes so large or it can rupture with very mild trauma and the spleen of course is a spot where there's it's an organ that's full of a lot of blood and if it ruptures people can very rapidly bleed to death so the presentation is fever swollen lymph nodes in the neck but also in the armpits and groin which is not something you would typically see with other causes of sore throat and so that kind of distinguishes it if they've got a sore throat and you feel in their armpit or you feel in the inguinal region and you feel swollen lymph nodes that's a, a pretty good sign of mono the patient's often severely fatigued when i had this i didn't want to get up off the couch for a week i felt so lousy and for two months after i felt pretty bad and actually had a relapse at one point and you just feel terrible and the sore throat You'll typically see a lot of white, pussy-looking material on the throat called exudate. You can see some redness, but typically it's more the exudate than the redness. And the treatment is symptomatic. It's viral, so there's no specific medicine for it. Um, just make them feel better. Don't give them aspirin. And caution them against any abdominal trauma because the spleen could be enlarged. Influenza is a viral infection. It's a primary pulmonary infection with systemic symptoms. Stomach flu, gastroenteritis, is not influenza. It's a different virus. Um, and flu tends to be epidemic. The virus uh, can change significantly over time, and you end up with a pandemic. So year to year, people will have some recurrent immunity, uh, but you, you typically don't don't do terribly a year to year but then you get a pandemic and no one really has the immunity and so you end up with everybody getting sick and this is when the virus changes to a new one that no one's seen in a long time and there is annual vaccination so make sure that you get vaccinated uh, to prevent recurrence or to get to keep you from getting infected any given year the presentation is really that of a, a bad cold with a fever so you get a cough shaking chills muscle and joint aches and pains headache and feel very lousy and if somebody presents that way and you're in flu season it's the flu um, pneumonia can present the same way so that needs to be a consideration and a patient with flu can progress to a bacterial pneumonia about 10,000 or so people die every year in the US from flu so you need to be aware of it uh, that it can get pretty bad so if someone's got flu try to isolate them a mask if they're outside of a single birth otherwise keep them in a single birth room symptomatic care for them there are antivirals that can be given those shorten the duration of the illness by about 12 hours up to 24 hours so for a 7 to 10 day illness they don't do very much and they have a lot of side effects including potentially seizures which you really wouldn't want your any of your crew members having seizures so if they are otherwise healthy there are no recommendations for antivirals and if they're very ill consider evacuation malaria is something you may see it's a protozoan infection um, there's four common plasmodia that do this but two of them account for the vast majority uh, plasmodium uh, falciparum and plasmodium vivax and they are prominent in different areas they're all transmitted by the uh, female anopheles mosquito the distribution tends to be rural so urban ports are are lower risk but not zero risk so your big prevention effort is to counsel your crew members to stay indoors from dusk to dawn which is when the mosquitoes are out biting if they're outside they need a long sleeve shirt they need insect repellent they if they're not sleeping inside they need to sleep under insecticide treated bed nets if they are sleeping inside they need to have the windows closed air conditioning on and given 
you can, depending on how long they are going to be somewhere, you can consider prophylaxis. Uh, so there are some medications they can take um, to prevent them from getting this. The presentation is for falciparum 12 to 14 days after exposure, for Vivax several months after exposure. And sort of the classic presentation is paroxysmal fever with shaking chills and then headache, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea, and then the fever breaks and they defervesce and they have a drenching sweat, and then they're asymptomatic between these crises. And that's release of the plasmodium into the blood uh, recurrently um, because it, it goes into the red blood cells and then reproduces and ruptures them. And that's when they're having these symptoms is during this release. And there can be some significant complications. You can get cerebral malaria or kidney failure from this. The treatment's bed rest. Take a blood sample. Um, it can be later evaluated. You can also make a slide smear of it to keep to give to health authorities. You're going to do a daily urinalysis to make sure that there's no blood in the urine, no signs of kidney failure, and talk to medical control. As soon as you suspect this, you treat it and consider evacuation for sick individuals. Meningitis is infection or inflammation of the meninges, the layers around the brain, the tissues that surround the brain. And there's lots of causes, bacteria, and the big one that worries us is meningococcus, but that's not the most common one now, uh, particularly with immunization for meningococcus. It's a lot of bacteria that can do this, viruses and fungi, and it's very hard to differentiate what's causing this. So the, the presentation is a fever with a headache, potentially altered mental status. As the meninges, which go down around the spinal cord, cause a lot of inflammation, they put the muscles of the neck into spasm, and the neck becomes very stiff. And not just that it hurts to move the neck, but the, there's so much muscle spasm that they can't bring their chin to their chest. They can't look straight up at the ceiling. Uh, there's just tightness in the neck. And if they've got meningococcus, they'll get a petechial rash. And if you have someone with headache, fever, and a petechial rash, it's, you're, you're almost certain it's meningococcus. Treatment is talk to medical control. They need antibiotics now, ceftriaxone, 2 grams IV. Um, if you can't get the IV, give it IM, but preferably IV. If you can't get in touch with medical control and you think there's meningitis, give the antibiotics. If they, you think it's meningococcal, they'll probably recommend steroids because uh, meningococcus can also result in deafness and prepare to evacuate these patients. They need to not be shipboard. Pharyngitis is a sore throat, um, inflammation or infection of the throat. There's lots of different causes. Sometimes it's chemical, uh, oftentimes it's viral, and about 10 to 15 percent of the time it's group A strep, so bacterial. It's usually superficial, but you can get invasion into the soft tissues and get abscesses either on the sides of the neck, around the tonsils, or actually in the soft tissues in the back of the throat, a retropharyngeal abscess, and those are pretty bad. Uh, it can be tricky to sort out what's going on, and the presentation will typically be a sore throat with maybe difficulty swallowing, fever, swollen lymph nodes, generally feeling poorly. They may have a rash. They may have cold symptoms. They may have difficulty breathing, and that becomes concerning. So is it strep throat? Remember, only 15% of the time is this going to be strep throat, so you don't want to give everybody antibiotics because that would be 85% you know, of the time the wrong thing to do. So if they have three or more of the following, there's a greater than 50% chance they have strep throat. So exudate on the tonsils or the posterior throat with redness. And look at those tonsils, that white gunk on there, that's exudate. The tonsils are redder than the surrounding tissue. That's strep throat. Uh, a fever, and that's a measured fever. They can't just say to you, I feel like I had a fever. If they measured their temperature or you measured their temperature and it's greater than 103 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, that's a fever. Tender lymph nodes below the jaw um, and no cough or cold symptoms. So any three of those, greater than 50% chance that that's strep throat and so you're going to treat it with antibiotics. Now danger signs. Any difficulty swallowing saliva, not just foods, but if they can't handle their own saliva, that means there's a lot of swelling somewhere, that's bad. If they're drooling, it means they can't swallow their saliva, that's bad. 
if they have difficulty speaking, and I'm not talking about they're just hoarse, um, or even that they've lost their voice, but when they try to speak, they can't get the air through, or they're having a lot of trouble breathing. If they've got asymmetric neck swelling or non-lymph node neck swelling, so look at that lower picture there, that swelling there, that's not lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are small bumps right under the jaw. You know, they can get large, but that's huge. That's, uh, that's Ludwig's angina, which is actually a pus pocket, an abscess under the tongue, and that can block off the airway. And then if the uvula is pushed sideways from the midline, so that upper picture, you can see that one tonsil on the patient's right is pushed way over, and the uvula is pushed to the left, that is a peritonsillar abscess, and that can get much worse as well. Treatment for viral pharyngitis is symptom control. The best thing to do is take some lidocaine, uh, 60 mLs of 2% lidocaine if you've got it. Mix it with a liter of normal saline, and the patient can gargle that, gargle that every 4 to 6 hours. Acetaminophen, and if they've got cold symptoms with this, decongestants as well. For bacterial, strep throat, symptom control, so the lidocaine, the acetaminophen, oral steroids, discuss this with medical control, they actually greatly decrease the duration of symptoms and oral antibiotics, and even after they're asymptomatic, they have to finish the course of antibiotics. Viral and bacterial pharyngitis are both contagious, so treat any symptomatic contacts. If you're treating one as viral, treat the contact as viral. If you're treating somebody for a presumed strep throat, if one of their contacts gets the same symptoms, treat it as strep throat, even if they don't have uh, three, at least three of those criteria. And if you see any red flags, contact medical control. They need either IV or IM antibiotics because those really bad things are almost always bacterial infections and they need to be evacuated. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection with the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's highly contagious and very difficult to control. It comes in through the lungs and it can be a lung disease but can also spread throughout the body. Only the pulmonary form is contagious and only 10% of people who are infected actually get tuberculosis, the actual disease. The presentation is a cough, um, typically with bringing up blood, hemoptysis with night sweats, fever, uh, weight loss, and gradual worsening. Nobody with tuberculosis should ever be allowed, active tuberculosis should ever be allowed on the ship because it can spread to the crew. But if you have someone who starts to develop symptoms or they've just gotten bad enough that they bring it up to you, they need to be on droplet precautions, they need to be in a single berth, um, and if they go outside of the cabin, they need to wear a mask. It's going to be very hard to distinguish this from other causes of chronic cough without a chest x-ray, so discuss with medical control how best to manage the patient. There are many, many other infectious diseases. Uh, so read the textbook, the International Medical Guide for Ships, that's got good information in it. Talk to medical control. Uh, the Emergency Medicine Resident Association of the American College of Emergency Physicians has an antibiotic guide that's excellent. There's a paper version or an app, and those are both excellent sources, both for information about diseases and common organisms and also best treatment options. And then there's any number of textbooks that you can read. Um, Five-minute clinical consults is very helpful as well. But make sure you have other references available to you. Please complete any knowledge, reviews, or assessments associated with this presentation. And if you have any questions, contact your instructor or professor. Thank you very much. You also have a system of lymphatic.